All right. Well, good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, they're pulling it out. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 18, and we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures this morning. And the title of the message is True Friendship. And we're going to be looking at the story of David and Jonathan, one of the great friendships literally in all of history. It shaped the nation. It shaped really all, all of our lives, this friendship between the most unlikely of people, Jonathan and David. And we're talking about friendship this morning because the vision and mission is to end spiritual loneliness. And that, first of all, starts with our vertical disconnection with God. But secondly, it, God calls us into a deep relationship with him, but also with one another, a community, and we're going to talk this morning about friendship, the, the, the possibility, the priority, and the privilege that we have of, of cultivating and growing friendship. And more than that, the absolute necessity that we need friends, true friends in this life. We do not get to be, we will not become the people that God wants us to be without true friends. So 1 Samuel chapter 18, pick up with me, and we're going to kind of peruse our way through several uh, chapters. We're just going to highlight a few verses. It's a story that's very long, but we're going to key in on a couple of things. Verse one, we read this. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, and he gave it to David. And his armor, even his sword, and his bow, and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Chapter 19, verse 1. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself, and I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. And if I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David, because he's not sinned against you. And because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand and he struck down the Philistine and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Chapter 20, pick up with me in verse 12. And Jonathan said to David, the Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But it should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he was been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Drop down with me to verse 40, chapter 20. And Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy, and he said to him, go and carry them to the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. Then they kissed one another and wept with one another and David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord saying, the Lord shall be between me and you, between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose, departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Finally, chapter 23, verse 15. David said that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, do not fear for the hand of Saul, my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. 
Saul, my father, also knows this. And the Lord, excuse me, and the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish, and Jonathan went home. I wonder if I asked you a question, how many friends do you have? How would you come up with that uh, answer to that question? Is it a quantity? Is it quality? Where would you go to, to ascertain that? As you think in your mind about the friends that you really have, think about the quality of friends that you have. I mean, you interact with people all day, every week, every month, every year, some you know, in your community, some at work, some in your family, some that you've known for years, some that you've met recently. I, I was just scrolling through Facebook and I realized I'm dating myself as 40 year olds and plus we're still on Facebook, it's this thing and some of you are laughing. But... And it's funny because Facebook has a way of identifying the people that you connect with and they call them your friends. And I kind of laughed at that because I, I looked and I had over a thousand something friends. And as I kind of scrolled through the list of my quote friends, some of these people I hadn't seen since high school. Some of these people I have no idea who they are or how they became my friends. And every once in a while, I'll see something, I'll check Facebook, and you get one of these weird posts. I don't know if you ever got one of these. If whoever my real friends were, they'll tell me these five things and prove it. I'm like, I don't need to prove my friendship to somebody, whoever you are on Facebook. If that's the, the, the definition of a friendship, I, no thank you. At least some of the other, you know, other accounts, they have followers and people who subscribe to you. But truly, who are your friends? Who are the people that you can count on the people that give into your life, that speak into your life, that are changing and transforming your life. Who are your people that in the middle of the night, should you be anywhere, you can call and they will be there. Who are your, quote, ride or dies? How many true friends do you really have? And the reality is we we realize not all friends are created equal. And if we're honest, most of the folks that we interact with in life are more acquaintances. They're, they're friends, but they're not the kind of friends that are being used to ch- shape us and change us. The Bible tells us if we are going to make it, if we're going to end spiritual loneliness, first of all, it's vertical, but second, it's horizontal. We, we were made for relationship. And I want to look this morning at, like I said earlier, one of the most important friendships that this world has ever seen. The Bible highlights this. And, and I read several verses over several chapters, and what do we read? We're we're reading about the friendship between two unlikely people. And God is highlighting this for us. David, the man after God's own heart. There's more written about David than anybody else in Scripture except for Jesus. And we all aspire, we desire to be like David for the most part. I want to be a man. I want to be a woman after God's own heart. And when you look at his life, there's these big, long narrative arcs that kind of give us a glimpse of what made David, David. And one of these big arcs is the story of his friendship with Jonathan and the importance of this friendship, how essential this friendship was for David ultimately to be king, for David to become the man after God's own heart. God used this friendship in the same way we need these kinds of friendships in our lives. We will never make it unless we grow, choose, and keep good friends. So I want to look this morning at three main things and a few sub points. Number one, the need for true friendship. We need friends. And I want to show us in Scripture and the story why we need friends. Number two, what makes a good friend? What are the ingredients to, to true friendship? And finally, how do I become a friend? How do I experience this? How do I become a friend to other people? Well, chapter 18 begins right after 17. And 17 is, to this point, the pinnacle of David's life. We know the story. It's David slaying Goliath. If you're a Christian, you know the story. Even if you're not a Christian, you you know about David slaying Goliath. And so David, a a young man, late teens, goes out, steps forward in faith, slays the giant, cuts his head off. All of Israel is cheering. There is hero worship taking place. Literally on on the top 40 billboard charts of Israel at that time, they're singing a song, Saul has killed his thousands and David is tens of thousands. That's what they're singing. David is brought into the courts of the king. He is at an all-time high. Life is good. Samuel has anointed David. He knows he will be the next king. He's not bragging about it. Saul doesn't know this at this point. But while there's hero worship taking place, there's hero envy being created in the heart of Saul. And he's threatened by him. And so David goes from the mountains, which we know very quickly, to the valleys, We know, for those of us who know the story, God uses this time, these these years in the wilderness to help refine David's character, to shape him, to prepare him for the throne. 
But during this time, humanly speaking, it is an evil time. It is a wicked time. It is the most painful time of David's life. And during this time, we we see this thread where Saul is throwing spears at him, where David is literally running for his life. And there's this thread that runs through the whole time. It's this friendship with Jonathan. As the evil is brought to him, Jonathan is constantly acting as a buffer. Jonathan, as a friend, is constantly saying to David, David, God is with you. David, God is for you. David, you will be king. This is not your story. This is not the end. David, God is with you. And there's this friendship. And so we see that this period, this evil period of David's life is literally bracketed on both sides by this friendship with Jonathan. And in many ways, Jonathan helps contain the evil that was meant for David through the hands of his father, Saul. What this tells us, humanly speaking, is David does not get through this time without a true friend. David does not get through this deep, dark, evil, wicked time. He does not get to the throne, humanly speaking, without the friendship of Jonathan. You and I will never get to where God desires us to be. We'll never become who God wants us to be, who we want to be, unless we have true friends, a friend like a Jonathan until we learn to cultivate and appreciate and celebrate what it means to have a friend and to be a friend. Jonathan makes this covenant with David and this friendship helps form and shape David's life, literally protects David's life. You see, you and I, we were made for relationship. Why is friendship so important? And listen, friendship is not a sign of weakness. For those of you who desire, and I know that's a desire, As I speak about friendship, I can see the look in many of your eyes. There's a a look of longing. There's a look of desire, like, I want that. I need that. It resonates. Why? It's not a sign of weakness. To, To want and to need somebody else is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of health. It's a sign that you are actually responding like God has created you to respond. In the book of Genesis, when God creates everything, he says, this is good, this is good. And then he goes, what? This is not good. What was not good? Adam was alone, right? Adam had no friend. He had no companion. He had no wife. We know what God did. He created Eve. But think about this. God creates within Adam, within all of us, the need for someone other than himself, other than God even. Now, ultimately, we're fulfilled in the Lord, but God designed us to need other people. Listen, even paradise, Eden is not enough without a friend. Even the most perfect situation is not enough without a friend. We need friends. The Bible tells us, science confirms this. I looked at countless studies this week from Harvard and other places on happiness and what makes a person happy and fulfilled. And in every study, in every list, the top three things was about friendship. It was about the friendships that people, healthy people are able to to create and to cultivate and to maintain. And for those who were able to cultivate, create, and maintain good friendships, it was a direct correlation to their happiness. One one doctor, Dr. Amy Banks, said this, and and she's more of a looking at the the human body, and she talked about, uh, described the, the effect of the vagus nerve and how it allows us to relax. And she went on to describe that when we're never allowed to uh, really make friends or we're not actually making friends, when we lack authentic friendship, she says that the vagus nerve is not exercised. And what it does is it loses tone. And as a result, we are left in a perpetual state of anxiety. It actually makes connections more difficult. So it's this sick, cyclical thing. When we don't make friends, it makes it harder to make friends. And we, we're left in a place of, of brokenness. Listen, science is always just catching up with the Bible. <laughs> You're right. The Bible says this in Proverbs 18, 24, and I think it's on the screen. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. If you don't have reliable friends, you'll come to ruin emotionally, mentally, physically, and certainly even spiritually. Without great friends, you are not making it. And some of you say, well, what about family? Of course, that's essential. What about marriage? And I would say this. What gets you through in marriage, what gets you through in family, it's the friendship in marriage that gets you through. That's the key. 
The romance is awesome. The hormones are amazing. That is what God created. That, that part's good. But it's the friendship, the deep abiding friendship that actually gets you through the deep, difficult times. It's the friendship with one another that actually helps form you and shape you, that commits you to one another, that allows you to become who you're supposed to be. Proverbs 17, 17 is on the screen. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for a time of adversity. We need friends. We need a a friend like a brother in those times of adversity. And I don't care who you are in this life, at some point you will all have a time of adversity. No one gets through this life without bumps, bruises, scrapes. Eventually we walk with the limp. And God becomes very real and present. But God becomes very real and present in your life oftentimes through a friend. The Bible talks about when we pass through, quote, deep waters. I think of that song from Carrie Job, Deep Waters. She describes, and, and I listen to that song, and it's like, oh, she's been through deep waters. And any of you who have ever been through deep waters in your life, and eventually we all will, it's the friends, it's the body of Christ that come alongside, that text you, that call you, that encourage you. And I have some of those friends here today that, that say God's with you and he's for you in that time of adversity. And so before that time comes, cultivate friends ahead of time so that you have them when that time of adversity is upon you. So I wonder when you think about friends, is there a smile? Is there a gratitude? Is there regret and pain? I do know this, it's a desire with all of our hearts. So number two, what makes a good friend? What, what, what are the ingredients? And there's, there's many things, but what are the things that I see in David and Jonathan's life? And I just pulled out a few things, but number one, and you'll see on the screen, true friendship is built on commitment, not convenience. In fact, the word that we see several times as I read it is a word that we don't use a lot, but it says David and Jonathan, they made a covenant with one another. And what this was, was a formal kind of a, with a ceremony of words exchanged and oftentimes some actions that were uh, involved, but they were committing themselves, not just emotionally, not just kind of theoretically, but intentionally. Listen, we are committed to one another. Jonathan says, I see God's hand on your life, David. I'm going to stick by you. You will go to the throne. I know that. But think about this. Jonathan was the, the, the least likely person that should have been David's friend. Who was next in line for the throne? Jonathan. Jonathan is one of the most amazing characters in all the Bible. In fact, I could have titled this, this message, The Best King That Israel Never Had. Because Jonathan, when you look at his character, he would have been a great king. He would have been amazing. He had faith. He had, he had exploits of faith. He, he loved God. He, he was obviously willing to humble himself here, but he knew God had chosen David and there was no jealousy, which is an incredible testimony to the kind of character that Jonathan had. But it says they made a covenant with one another. This was not simply convenient because there was nothing convenient about this relationship. But the reality is most of our lives, they're geared and programmed towards relationships of convenience. And what do I mean by that? The places that you shop, the relationships, you might know some of the people that you frequent often, but it's still a relationship of convenience. I like to surf, and so there's times I go to surf shops, and I always love to walk in a shop. I just did it a couple days ago, and I smelled the wetsuit, and I smelled the surf wax, and I felt like a kid again in Huntington Beach. It was like, there's just like, But when I go to buy something, whether it's a wetsuit or a leash or a new board, there's certain places that I frequent but I know if the shop down the street is running a sale, guess where I'm going to buy? I'm going to buy the one that's cheaper down the street. I might know Mitch, you know, but I'm not going to Mitch's. Or I might know whoever. Like, I'm going to go there because I'm going to save 100 bucks. And, and the reality is we all do that. And I know that. You know that. And even the shop owner at the end of the day knows that. He might feel a little bummed and a little disloyal, but he knows he's doing the same thing. The problem is we treat our friendships the same way. We treat our friendships in the very same way. It's like, once this is no longer convenient, I'm out. Once this is no longer something I'm getting whatever I need out of it, I'm not committed anymore. And so what happens is we start to love things and use people instead of use things and love people. And so the world becomes filled with users, consumers, and our relationships are the same way. A lot of you are really good at networking. 
Some of you are really good, perhaps, on social media or other places. You have a lot of people that follow you, or you're good at influencing, but that's not friendship. That's not going to get you through. You're good at networking, and what a networking person does is they, they find people because a person opens doors to them whether it's to land a sale, whether it's to open doors for an opportunity, whether it's to get into a new friend group. And so networkers are always looking at you, labeling you, sizing you up because they want to use you. And that can be helpful in business. Listen, we all do that. If you're on LinkedIn, it's kind of the process to try to get a new job. And it's kind of the way the world works, except for when we treat everybody like that. And I don't know if you've ever had the, the, the feeling at some point you thought you were friends with somebody. You thought there was a real connection, and at the end of the day, oh, they're just using me. Have you ever felt that or ever had that happen? I remember one time somebody all of a sudden was doing something to me, and I thought this guy was my friend, and I realized, oh, you just read how to you know, win friends and influence people. You were literally going down the book and using my name five times and doing all this. And I was like, dude, this is the most disingenuous thing, such a total turnoff. And yet we're really good at networking, but are we good at making friends? See, a true friend doesn't size you up, label you, and categorize you. As believers, what we want to find out is what makes you unique? What has God called you to do? What are the gifts that you have? What do you bring as, to the table as part of the body of Christ? And, and so we all have different layers of friends. As a church, we should be a group of friends, but we're also always going to have an inner circle of friends. Even Jesus, he had a big crowd, he had 12, he had three, and then he had a best friend, John. All of us will have different levels of friends, but we're trying to find out what those gifts are, those strengths are, and even those weaknesses, not to exploit them, but to come alongside and at times even gently correct. The moment Jonathan looks at David, Jonathan subordinates his own desires for the needs of his friend. He sacrifices He's a real friend. He looks at his friend's life and says, God has a plan for his life, and I want to be part of that. And listen, that's what happens in marriage. I remember hearing somebody say this one time, and, and I use it oftentimes when I get to officiate weddings. But when two people come together, you know, when, when husband and wife are making a vow to one another, one of the things that you should be doing, there should be a horizon out there that you're looking towards. But you're also, you fall in love with who the person is, but you also get a glimpse of who that person is becoming what God has planned for that person. And what you're committing to in friendship, in marriage and any friendship is you're saying, I wanna be a part of what God is doing in your life. And however, and to how, how much I can be, I wanna be used to help you become the person God wants you to be. And hopefully they're doing the same for you. And here's something beautiful to just kind of wrap your mind around. Because someday husband and wife or close friends, all of us, we will stand in the presence of God. And the Bible says at that point we'll be glorified. New bodies, sin is done away with. We will become the men, the women, the sons and daughters that God envisioned us, he envisioned you to be. And you'll be able to stand next to your spouse or your friend and you'll see them in that state, just glorified. And you'll be able to say, I always knew you could look like this. That's what a real friend does. It's like, and is that easy? No. Is it, is it always perfect? No, it's hard. It gets messy at times. But that's why it's, it's a commitment, not convenience. Number two, true friendship is built upon honesty and transparency. Or rather, true friends let you in and never let you down. Honesty. You're being honest with one another. You're being intimate with one another. It says David and Jonathan loved each other as their own souls. What does that mean? They got below the surface. They shared their deepest hopes and fears and aspirations, their motives. They were deeply emotional. We read about them embracing, weeping, even kissing. What does that mean? It means it's not like what this world twists and wants it to be. No, it's, it's actually beautiful. Two very strong, godly, warrior, leader men are willing to be vulnerable with one another, to be open with one another. And God highlights this and says, this is This is beautiful. As iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. That's what they were doing. They were sharpening one another. They were encouraging one another. It says, Jonathan strengthened David. He strengthened his hand in the Lord. See, a true friend lets you in. You get vulnerable. And that's hard, right? To, to let somebody really see you is a scary place to be. But again, we won't be who God wants us to be without that. 
David would say in Psalm 139, search my heart, O God, see if there be any wicked way in me. And that's a scary thing. I don't know if you've ever prayed that because God answers that prayer sometimes. It's like, oh. But we should not only pray that and invite God to expose things, but there should be a few people in your life that you say, you have a hunting license. I, I, I trust you enough. I have blind spots and I want to be a man of character. I want to love my wife. I want to be a true friend. What are the areas in my life that you see that I don't see? And I trust you enough to not get defensive to not make excuses, but to believe the best about you, that you really want what's best for me. And so I allow you to see, and I allow you to speak into those areas of my life. Thirdly, true friendship is built upon a common passion. Listen, that's why they are discovered more than they're made. True friendship is really something you discover. What do I mean? C.S. Lewis writes a lot about friendship. He has a book called The Four Loves, and, and he speaks a lot on friendship, and he says this, Friendship is born at the moment when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. You see the same thing I see? You love that book too? You love that spot too? Or whatever it might be. And to to the various degrees of whatever that you too is, it it binds somebody. It's why we have these affinity groups. There's these things that people share a common passion in. Jonathan saw David and he said, you too? The the crowds were hero worshiping. His dad had hero envy, but Jonathan saw the real hero, which was God. And he saw in David somebody who knew who the real hero was. And he was like, yeah, you love God. I love God. You really love Israel. Jonathan really loved Israel. And it was two, two things at that moment, two people who were not supposed to be friends, but this thing forged them into this deep friendship, this unity, this passion for the Lord, and this passion for Israel. That's why C.S. Lewis says the paradox is this, that friendship can never merely be about itself. That's what he says. That's why those pathetic people who simply, quote, want friends can never find any. The very condition of having friends is we should want something else besides friends, where the truthful answer to the question is, do you see the same truth? The truthful answer would be, I see nothing. I don't care about the truth. I only want a friend. There is nothing the friendship is about. It can go nowhere. Nothing can be shared. Those going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. True friendship, there's a horizon. There's a vision. You're you're going someplace with my best friends, my best friend, my wife. We share the same passion. There was a moment, you too, you love the Lord like I love the Lord. You've been through some of the same waters that I've been through. We get each other. And it's not just about each other. It's not just, you know, it sees those lovers face to face, but there's also a shoulder to shoulder. And this is where we're headed. There's a common vision and mission. And so some of you who are dating, you, you better figure out more than just the hormones and more of the excitement, where are you guys going? Because six months or a year after the marriage, if you don't have a friendship and you, you don't have a vision of where you're going, you're going to be like, what's this about? It has to be about something else. And as a church, when we are committed to the Lord, when we're committed to this vision and mission, there's a friendship, there's something that binds us, there's this common passion that is moving us forward. I love the the King James version. I read it earlier, a friend sticks closer to the brother. The King James says, there's a friend who sticketh (laughs) closer than a brother. Every once in a while, the King James is good to bring out. I don't know about you, but I want some of those friends that sticketh. (laughs) You know, that they're around when you need them. If you're going to have a friend that sticketh, Jesus better be the thing that make them ticketh. (laughs) You know? That's got to be the thing. If Jesus is what makes you tick, then your friendship is going to stick. Finally, how do you become a true friend? Because it's selfish. Excuse me, we are selfish at times. It's hard to like bear one another's burdens. It's hard sometimes when your friend is going through a time of adversity, night after night, week after week, just to listen to them as they process, because that processing lets them know they're seen and heard, but it's hard sometimes. It's hard to keep showing up, and it's scary to be vulnerable. How do we become a true friend? And and I would say this, how do you become a true friend? The question isn't, how do I find this friend? Is that that's your driving goal? How do I find this friend? You're, You're not gonna find them. It's like the proverbial, how do I find Mr. Right? How do I find Mrs. Right? You become Mr. Right. You become Mrs. Right and then trust God. So the question is, how do I become a friend like Jonathan? How how do I do this? I want to be, 
I want to have friends like this, but I also want to be a friend like this. Let's look at what Jonathan did, because it's incredible. Jonathan sees David, and Jonathan's quite a few years older than David, but there was something that bound them. It says there, we read in verse 18, Jonathan took off his robe. That's his royal robe. He gives him his sword. He's given his allegiance. He's saying, I follow you, I submit to you. He lays aside his crown and he swore an oath to see that his friend thrived. Jonathan was a loyal friend and a son. He continued to talk to his father and plead and intercede on behalf of his friend. His friendship to David cost him. Eventually, it costs him his life. The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes our friends that wound us to encourage us, but also faithful are are the wounds of a friend who sometimes take them for us. And when we look at the life of Jonathan, it points me to what Jesus did for us. Because Jesus laid aside his robe. He, Philippians 2, he left heaven. He left those things. He laid aside his crown. Why? Because he calls you friend. Jesus said to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friend. On the screen, John 15, 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. David was saved by the wounds of his friend. You and I, we are saved by the wounds of our friend Jesus. And so is it scary to be vulnerable with a a, a friend? Yes. But here's the thing. Your truest friend, your ultimate friend, he sees everything about you and he loves you. You are fully known and you are fully loved. Your friend sticketh forever. (laughs) So here's the thing. Sometimes we don't want people to see everything. It's a little bit scary. And there's going to be times when your friends see things that you may not want them to see. But guess what? The Lord already knows. And when you realize if the one who matters more than anybody else in all of the universe, if he sees and he knows and he loves and he stands by me, okay, they saw something I didn't want them to see. We can fix it. We can work on it. God's exposing it. When I come across somebody and it's hard to keep loving and I feel like, oh, this is hard, I feel selfish, and I realize, ah, I'm not if I'm getting my needs met, I have the truest friend in all of the universe who meets every single need that I have. And because he meets my needs, emotionally, physically, spiritually, I am able to keep being a friend. I am able to keep pouring out. I have a friend who has a heart for me And so I have everything I need, and so I am free to be a friend to others. Church, friends, you were called into a relationship with God that is far deeper than you ever imagined. But he also invites you, challenges you, has made you for relationships with others that are far deeper than you ever imagined as well. May we be a church that is that that are that is a church that is friends with God, but friends with one another. That when people come here, whether it's here or La Jolla, they enter in and go, man, God is in their midst. These people love one another. They're friends. And the the truth is, as Christians, we have the opportunity to be friends that the world will never have because our friendships are eternal. Our friendships have the greatest passion that binds us that this world will ever know. It's Jesus because he makes us ticketh. (laughs) It's the Lord. What makes you an attractive friend is when you are captivated by Jesus. What made David attractive to Jonathan? Because God had captivated Jonathan's heart and uh, David's heart and Jonathan's like, I want to be a part of that. And the friends that I like to run with are the ones that aren't just, they don't like, I mean, I have friends that do this and that, but the ones I really run with are the ones that, man, they love the Lord and and they're running for Jesus. Those are the guys that I want to be around. And so I want to be that. If I want that, then I need to be that for other people. This week, is there a friendship that you need to repair? Is there someone or some ones that the Holy Spirit is highlighting to you and maybe you need to repair or maintain or, or build that friendship, to appreciate that friendship, not just for what they've done, but in turn, what you can do for them. Maybe it's, maybe it's in your marriage. You've neglected the friendship 
You, you, you've no longer, you're no longer walking shoulder to shoulder and it's time to come together and to figure out where are we going and what's the mission, what's the vision that God has. Church, Jesus calls you his friend. You are his friend if you open your heart to him. And if you've never done that, today's a day where you can do that. Jesus loves you. You can come find myself or one of the pastors afterwards and we can talk to you about what does it mean to have a relationship with the creator of the universe who wants to be your friend. Father, we thank you so much for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to your church. Now give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying collectively to captivate, but also give us ears to hear what you are saying individually to your sons and daughters. God, may we be friends with you, and may we be friends to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.